full-time Libertarian Party meeting in probably at least 10 years. Uh, but uh, for those who don't know me, uh, I am uh, uh, I, I'm an elected county commissioner here in Macomb County. Uh, but my history in politics and as a Libertarian go back much farther than that. Um, as a matter of fact, it's a little bit ironic because when I used to, when I was a kid, and I used to work at Lakeside Mall, the store, my coworker and really good friend at the time was a hardcore leftist. He would self describe himself as a communist. And I was uh, a hardcore, self described libertarian. And the irony is, he ended up going to work for EDS and for major corporations as a communist, and I went to work for government <laughs> as, a, as a libertarian. Um, but uh, I, I started out in politics uh, when I was in high school. Went to a, a 1984 Ronald Reagan came to Macomb County. I didn't know anything about libertarian. I've never heard the word before. You know, 1984. I went to see Reagan speak, and he gave a speech that sort of outlined uh, why he thought government was a problem. He talked about getting rid of apartments and this and that. We all know that uh, Ronald Reagan was not a libertarian, but he had some good rhetoric and some, uh, you know interesting ways of framing things that, that was very interesting to me. Uh, so I got excited got involved in the Macomb County at the time and started volunteering on campaigns and ended up uh, volunteering on a lot of uh, uh, campaigns to the point where I was later managing campaigns uh, in the early 90s uh, for the State House, we were for the State House, and eventually got a job in the State Legislature working for a Republican lawmaker, State House member, and I worked for three different legislators over six and a half years as a staffer before running for office myself the first time uh, for county commissioner in 1998. Uh, and I won that position, was re-elected in 2000. Uh, right after my re-election in 2000, my, my state representative passed away, unfortunately, um, from cancer, and they had a special election to fill the vacancy. So I ran for that, I won for the state legislature, and so I was there six years as a state lawmaker. Turned out, Ran for county commissioner, went insane because I hated being county commissioner the second time around. Uh, it's dropped the, uh, it, so it didn't run for re-election. Became an activist for a number of years, working for the Michigan Taxpayers Alliance, which I created in 2007. Um, and uh, no, why don't we take a pa uh, take a pause oh. and order? Okay. All right. That um, you had. Uh, Whatever candidate you ran for the highest position for had to get 5% of the vote in order for the party to qualify to get major party status in the following election. But that was a very bad disincentive for the Libertarian Party to run someone for governor or for high offices because it's harder to get 5% of the vote for governor than it is for State Board of Education or something. <laughs> so I introduced a legislation to change it so that uh, Minor parties of the Libertarian Party, could, if they got 5% of the vote for any of their statewide candidates, it would qualify instead of just the highest one. The Michigan Civil Rights Initiative. And the Michigan Civil Rights Initiative would amend the state constitution to prohibit governments in Michigan, state or local, or any government in Michigan, from uh, treating people differently based on their race, gender, or ethnicity. It would essentially ban what many people would call a fruit of action program. Uh, but we call them racial preference programs. So uh, that ballot initiative, it took us three years to get out of the ballot. We failed to get out of the 2004 ballot for a variety of reasons. And then so we kept going, and in 2006 we got out of the ballot. It was approved by 58% of voters. At the same time, uh, I was able to co-write and put through a committee that I chaired uh, another constitutional amendment uh, that uh, restricted eminent domain abuse um, that was uh, pre you know, prevalent in many uh, in many states, including Michigan, where you know property was kind of condemned and given to General Motors, and uh, condemnations were unfortunately, you know, relatively common. So uh, we got through. Uh, the kinds of, how, yeah. how is eminent domain abuse defined? I mean, well, we, what's, we what makes it abuse? It as, um, takings for a non-governmental okay. entity. So giving it to General Motors. Yeah, Donald you, Trump. Yeah, down <laughs> you know, say, uh, we didn't stop it in a domain from being used for a, a highway or something like that. Uh, we have the most for that, but, you know, to stop it from being used to, uh, you know, the, the, the classic case was the, um, the case that went to the Supreme Court, the Kelo decision, which many of you may not know, but it was a, uh, a, a town in Connecticut decided that some property along a waterfront 
would generate more tax dollars if it was high-end condos. So they wanted to condemn everybody's house and take their house from them so they could give it to a developer to develop condos, and they called it a public use because it's going to generate more tax dollars, and therefore it's going to benefit the public, so it's a public use. And the, the Supreme Court uh, unfortunately agreed with uh, the, the town's decision, and the backlash from that was a lot of people were outraged from the left and the right. And we were able to, in Michigan, uh, get a constitutional amendment to end that kind of abuse. It was on the ballot and passed over in 2006. So I guess I'm proud of a couple of things. One, helping the Libertarian Party get major ballot status. Uh, two, uh, two constitutional amendments, you know, that amended the, the state constitution. And uh, I've tried a number of other things uh, as an activist, some of which were not as successful. For example, after Governor Granholm uh, led the effort to raise the state income tax in 2007, uh, the, my, the group that I was working with and working with today, the Michigan Taxpayers Alliance, launched a recall effort against the Speaker of the House to try and recall him for his uh, role in that income tax increase. Well, it took us a lot longer than we expected in a ton of political battles uh, and legal battles. We had to go to federal court to get our signatures uh, affirmed, and we eventually did, but the effect of which was it pushed the recall election into the regular election day. So it essentially rendered the point moot. Um, so we did not win that battle. Um, and, but I've been an activist on, on, a, on a wide array of issues, mostly taxpayer rights issues and, and tax battles. The Michigan Taxpayers Alliance is a group that I helped form in 2007. Uh, we defeated a, uh, a couple of key issues. In 2011, we defeated a Macomb County-wide intermediate school district tax proposal that was on a, uh, a ballot. And it was nearly defeated. As a matter of fact, it was the only significant tax increase was on ballot in Southeast Michigan that ended up being defeated. Uh, and we like to take credit for having um, you know, made that possible. And then similarly, we took up the uh, battle against the uh, regional transit tax on uh, the ballot. I mean, the uh, ballot was passed in November. Remember the bus tax that was on the ballot? So uh, we uh, formed a group to oppose that bus tax. And the pro-bus people, I didn't realize how well organized they were, the pro-mass transit folks. They've been working on their plan for a number of years and garnered a lot of uh, support from all the government agencies and the government leaders, and including some uh, corporate welfare types, um, like Dan Gilbert and you know, Mike Gillich and all those folks, were all in favor of this regional transit plan. And they spent $3.1 million on TV ads and on other efforts to get, the, uh, to get it passed. We were able to raise and spend about $65,000, uh, and it ended up failing by a little less than 1% of the vote. Mm -hmm. So we were very fortunate that we were able to play. That was the last election? That was yep. in uh, November of 2016. And Macomb was the deciding vote. Yep. Yeah, it was. Although I would, uh, Macomb was very important in that defeat, but we went into uh, all the counties, particularly in Detroit, uh, uh, where we actually took out radio ads on um, so urban radio stations and so forth. But we thought if we could get Detroit even to get a 25% no vote out of this, Detroit made a chance to vote. And we ended up getting a, a little more than 25%. Uh, so it, it, it was key. You know, winning Macomb wouldn't have been enough if we didn't also beat it down a little bit as far as it's called Detroit. But yeah, Macomb is the biggest, uh, the biggest county that we got. And, and you were also, uh, you had gone on uh, Detroit Today, right, uh, to offer up the counterpoint? Well, we went on every TV, you know, local TV station that we could find, you know, those Sunday morning TV shows, you know, to talk about why we were opposed to it. We were fortunate that, oh, oh, uh, <laughs> just by having uh, an opposition group, every time the pro side went on a radio talk show, they felt like they had to get the opposition side out, so we got a lot of free media. So very successful in that. And um, I, I, right now, we're involved in two things, and, and John Keenan oh, knows a lot John. about that. He's been a huge help. I love that. Uh, we are ba battling uh, Chippewa Valley School District as a millage request on the ballot. Again, uh, they have the second largest debt of all, any of the 522 school districts in the state of Michigan. Uh, second only is the city of Detroit. Uh, uh, I was, uh, sorry to interrupt, but um, did we ever figure out whether it was like the 478 or is it like the 611 that the Mackinac Center said? It's the, uh, I don't know exactly, but okay. they were so far in, ahead in second place that it doesn't matter. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, they are nowhere close to being the third place. Uh, okay. Like, as big as that. 
Um, and they um, and, and they're also doing what unfortunately an increasing number of uh, public entities do. They're asking for to borrow ninety million dollars um, for a twenty-five year bond, and with that twenty-five year bond, they're spending a third of it for technology upgrades like laptops, laptop carts. Computers, things which won't last 25 years. Things that won't last five years. Yeah, <laughs> yet, yet taxpayers will be paying for them for 25 years. Even the other things that they want to buy won't last 25 years. The buses, right? You know, buses don't last 25 years. So it's just been, it's just fiscal irresponsibility. So uh, John, myself, and a couple other activists have been working on uh, raising the money and putting out flyers and doing some robocalls and trying to run a campaign against this millage, which. Uh, which is good in the sense that a lot of these school districts don't expect that. They've gotten comfortable and used to nobody opposing them because they think taxpayers are relatively disorganized. And that, uh, and frankly, every, it, there's a reason for it just to be disorganized because everybody uh, realizes, well, this is going to cost me 100 bucks more a year. Do I want to kick in $200 to try and defeat it? Right. <laughs> you know, it's, it might not make sense. You know, so, uh, but we are, are doing a really good campaign against that. And finally, uh, on um, another issue that we're working on, uh, many of you probably all know that uh, April 15th is tax day. And, uh, yes, and uh, we are organizing a uh, protest uh, outside Mount Clemens Post Office, which is uh, on uh, Main Street, Mount Clemens, just a little bit south of the official county buildings there. And uh, we're going to have a uh, protest against the, uh, well, against taxes in general, right. but also against corporate welfare. Because it's a bit outrageous, the state legislature, uh, you may have read in the papers, uh, about a month ago, narrowly rejected uh, reducing the state income tax for everybody. Mm -hmm. When Granholm had increased the tax, she had said this is a temporary tax hike. And in 2015, it'll go away. Well, it didn't go away. And when, they, when the new speaker uh, came in and tried to make it go away, he fell short on the number of votes. Mm -hmm. So while they were rejecting reducing your taxes back to what they were allegedly were promised to be. They were also approving, though, uh, Dan Gilbert tax incentives. Yep. Uh, and uh, there's another group called Business Leaders of Michigan, which is a few other very uh, wealthy uh, companies that have put forward another uh, corporate welfare proposal. So apparently there's plenty of money to go around if you're well connected and you're donating to the political class. <laughs> but if you're not well connected and not donating to the political class, we don't have enough money in the state legislature to, to reduce your tax burden. Right. So we're going to talk about the, how they can they're, they're funding corporate welfare at the expense of everyday citizens, everyday taxpayers. Um, you know, I don't know if you know how the um, Dan Gilbert plan works, but the way it works is if he bu he builds a building, anybody who works in the building, uh, the company Dan Gilbert's company with, withholds their state income tax, just like most companies do for most of their employees, but they don't send that money to Lansing. They keep it. Hmm. Similarly, sales tax uh, from if they have a retail shop down below, they collect that, they collect that sales tax, and they, instead of what the other companies send it, they keep it. So essentially, now this would be actually a brilliant plan if it went to everybody. You know, right? Yeah, that would be <laughs> incredible. It would be yeah. a great idea. But when they're doing it for this person, but not that person. When they're telling uh, Boar's Head Meats that, you know what, we're going to give you a 50% tax cut, but Kobo's Meats, no, you have to pay full boat. You know, that's not... Uh, so they're essentially picking winners and losers. Yeah, that's not letting the market and customers drive things. That's mm -hmm. letting politicians drive things. It incentivizes politi people have to go to politicians for their, with their business plans instead of trying to get them, uh, customers to buy into them. Huh. So... Uh, so I hope that uh, uh, all you folks can uh, mark uh, April 18th from 5.30 to 7, although we'll probably get there a little early, uh, to set up. Um, bring sign, if you haven't, if not, we'll make some signs. We've got a bunch of them that were being made. Yep. We'll have a good old protest. We're going to invite some media to be there. Uh, we're going to try and send that message and, um, you know, get, get, and raise awareness. Uh, so feel free to bring, you know, Libertarian Party t-shirts, or I like your taxation of stuff shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy capitalism. So the same thing is on the 18th? Yeah, uh, because the 18th is tax day this year. Do that the day of leaving? Yeah, that's that actually the day I'm leaving. So. No okay. kidding. Really? Well, uh, you can't quickly stop by on your way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I leave at like 4.30 in the morning. So, you know, oh, man, we'll be lonely out there. <laughs>
<laughs> so I guess that's a little bit of my background and what I do, but I mostly want to hear uh, questions and hear from you guys. So yeah. Well, what else can you tell us about the uh, Taxpayers Alliance? Is that for one thing? Is it nonpartisan? Uh, yes, it's absolutely nonpartisan. Uh, the Taxpayers Alliance is not a membership-driven organization. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we solicit a bunch of members and everybody pays twenty dollars a year or anything like that. Hey, it's, it's really a core group of activists. It's a core group of people just coming together. Um, we don't have any employees. You, you know, uh, it's just volunteers, uh, and we um, we try to do what the government does in reverse. We evilly plot against them. So our goal is to is to find a way to stop uh, their evil plots against you. Right. <laughs> so, um, it's a lot of fun. And no, it's, it's been a blast working with you guys. It really has. Um, educational, obviously, as well. But, yeah, it's... Uh, I was hoping Simon would actually come today. Yeah, Simon, uh, unfortunately, has a bunch of kids. And, mm -hmm. yeah, I'd like to see him. I think you would have had a blast here, honestly. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, I mean, well, the textbook lines obviously can't take up every issue. Uh, right. We try where we can. You remember the May sales tax increase from a few years ago? Mm -hmm. We took that on, though we were not the main player there. Uh, there was a couple other groups that were putting more money into the feed that made the sales tax up. But we did what we could. Like we Club for Growth? What's that? Like Club for Growth? <laughs> no, uh, like uh, Paul Mitchell was doing congressman funded by 260000 Oh, yeah. My no, congressman? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we did what we could. But to be honest with you, I was asked, John, by a reporter uh, about this, uh, the Tax Voice Lions, what Sorry. we thought. It's okay. And I was thinking back on the issues that we did. Any tax battles we've taken up, as of today, we are undefeated. Really? Yes. Now, it's only been five. Right, but we're done. <laughs> That's... We are undefeated right now in defeating tax issues on the ballot. Nice. We are defeated in trying to stop them from lobbying through legislature. Awesome. But we're five and all when it comes to the ballot and when we commit resources. <clears throat> Which doesn't mean that we're uh, charmed. Right. You know, we, we could lose. These government agencies have tons more money than we do because they have all your money. <laughs> and exactly. They mail... They cheat by mailing educational flyers just to alert people about the election, but they're really pro yes vote flyers. Oh, yeah. They just can't say yes legally, but they basically say it. And they, so they campaign at our own expense, and then we've got to raise our money, you know, and uh, it's not always easy to do to try and yeah. you know, enough money to run something resembling a campaign. Right. So, any other questions? Um, can you, um, um, is there any time to discuss what's going on with the Chippewa Valley thing? Absolutely. Um, so we've sent out two mailers so far? Two mailers so far. The absentee voters. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, we've been getting them out to absentee voters so far. Honestly, I've only gotten really one bad. <laughs> review on it. Well, that's not good. The more, more hate we get, the more effective we probably are. Exactly. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and that's another thing. I mean, if we could collectively share the Facebook and uh, the website, that'll help get a little bit more exposure. Because yeah. um, obviously they're getting these flyers, but we will also want to make sure we have a media presence. Uh, social media presence, I should say. And, uh, our next step is we need to send out flyers to the non-absentees, and <clears throat> we are actually a little bit short on our funds. Um, we're going to be doing some fundraising. I'm going to be chipping in uh, probably about 100, 150 bucks personally. If anybody can help out with anything, any kind of donation, it would be fantastic. But even talking to people you know and um, asking them if they could donate, you're awesome. Thank you. To uh, <laughs> The Michigan Taxpayer Alliance, or even just if you want, give me money. I will write a check for all of us from the Michigan uh, or Macomb County Libertarians. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I would love to see us formally endorse this. Yeah, I think that'd be very cool and uh, beneficial for us. I appreciate that, John. Yeah, we, we you know, we, we're going to we, we pay for most of our absentee campaign. Right, but we're still we still owe the mailhouse that does the postage one thousand two hundred sixty bucks. Right, 
And then we got to do a non-absentee campaign to, the, you know, to try and get people out to vote. Um, the, right. the yes side is very effective at that. They've got a list of employees of the public school district, uh, and they, they have somebody posted every voting location. And they have a list of all the people who are, live in that voting location. They check them off as they come in right. of all their supporters, and they have a cell phone to call anybody who hasn't come in yet. So hey, you know, Jim, you haven't you haven't come to voted yes yet. You know, you're on your way. You're very effective. So it's up against the machine, and uh, we have to be a pretty damn lean machine. But we, uh, you know, we defeated the RTA millage. We defeated the ISD millage in the past. We defeated uh, uh, several other smaller uh, taxes. So we're confident that we can do it with the help. Right. Is that what you want to know? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, basically. Yeah. Um, is there? Uh, so is there a website specifically for the yes. uh, school? It's called stopcvtaxhike.org. And actually, um, the guy who helped me with this is Mike right here. Uh, Mike helped me uh, design that web page. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, yeah, he's really good at what he does, obviously. But um, cool. yeah, he's going to be helping out with some other stuff too, I'm guessing, because he's an awesome graphic arts guy. Well, I'm, I'm too modest to accept Austin. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to get a, a link to that. Uh, oh, yeah, I will, I will send that over to you. Absolutely. Get it to our website as well. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and I've been waiting. Um, are we fully up and running with the Macomb website now? Uh, yeah, the only thing is it's the Libertarian Party of Macomb County and not Libertarians of Oh, who cares? Semantics. You're, we're arguing semantics at that point. So, no. The words mean stuff, John. Libertarians loves. <laughs> you're, you're right. That's, that's been always our biggest thing here. We just, we just adore our semantics. Um, <laughs> other thoughts or issues? Uh, Curious about any, yeah. Um, I saw you speak a couple months ago at the campaign for liberty in Oakland, and you were talking about the first vote you had to take when you got into the state legislature about the the, the roads being cement oh, yeah, or yeah, asphalt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, could you? Uh, that was an interesting story. If you could share that, and also if you could talk about some of the other things in the state legislature you had to vote on for which there was absolutely no philosophical, you know, considerations, just sort of a technical issues. I was sharing uh, that story. Uh, because I was trying to tell a bigger picture that that oftentimes um, when when you're actually elected, it doesn't turn out to, to be what you thought it was going to be. <laughs> we right. oftentimes hear these stories about how the government spent eight hundred thousand dollars studying guinea pig poop, or you know <laughs> all this wasteful uh, wasteful things, and so we think, well, this will be easy. I just get elected, and I'm just going to vote no on anything that's you know ridiculous and stupid. Um, but then when you get there, you realize it's, it's, it's actually kind of complex. Now, I'll give you just four examples, and you guys tell me how you think I should have voted on each one of them. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the first is, I give an example, that even people who really are highly principled, very ethical, and decide they're going to try and make the best decision on behalf of taxpayers, have a oftentimes very difficult time doing this because you can't be an expert on everything. So when I was elected, it was to fill the vacancy of my state record passed away. <clears throat> So I, st I was stuck on four different committees, education, technology, tax policy, and one other one, uh, 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 transportation. So I get in for my first transportation committee hearing, and there's five bills on the agenda to vote on. And we have about 15, 20 minutes in each bill. And the first one is, should a section of state highway be paved in asphalt or concrete? And so we got a presentation by the asphalt engineers that represent the asphalt industry. And then we get a presentation by the concrete engineers that represent the concrete injury, industry. And now it's time to vote. <laughs> so which one do you support? The lowest bid. Oh, that would be the starter home industry. Or was this a sort of paved the road to start it? <laughs> 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 I would have to know It's a transportation oh, yeah. committee. Yeah. State so, of Michigan? Yep. Well, they're not going to do it right anyway, so pick the cheaper one. <laughs> that would be asphalt. That is true. Yeah. That would be asphalt. Yeah, the asphalt is absolutely the cheaper. Of course, the concrete will say, yes, it's cheaper, but in the over the long, long run, it's not cheaper. 
No, but and, our, our very vocal in the last four or five years. Well, but it, it, it you, all depends on You could study it, it but you've it. got five other or four other bills on the agenda. And then when you're done, you get to go over the technology committee and vote out the electrical code rewrite in the state of Michigan when you're done being an expert on roads. <laughs> and then when you're done being an expert on roads, you've got to go to the education policy committee. I mean, the problem is, it's impossible for a, a lawmaker. This is why we don't really believe in government being involved in all these things to begin with, because even if you're the most well-intentioned person, you can't make all those decisions accurately. Right. You just can't be an expert on in, an engineering expert and a uh, health expert. Uh, in, in all these uh, regulations, you just can't be an expert. So that's very difficult. Now, I want to share another... You um, can't be all these czars, unfortunately. Yeah, you know, sometimes, uh, the more you can let individual people and markets decide, the better off it's going to be, because there's just not... A, a small group of people have very <laughs> limited... Knowledge is not diffused. It's all just concentrated with politicians. And they just can't be into it everything. And I had a colleague of mine, uh, Fulton Sheen, who was a really good guy, in, a very earnest individual, who wanted to vote the right way and everything. But he couldn't possibly keep up with the legislation, and the research, and the studies, and trying to find out, and was constantly behind, and was endlessly frustrated. And when he found out that nobody really listened anyway, because nobody <laughs> had the time to go through all that stuff. So they end up voting, okay, let's see, the concrete people gave me 500 bucks, and the, the asphalt people gave me 1,000 bucks, so I guess the asphalt. Because they can't be experts. All right, another quick vote. You tell me how to vote on this one. So, um, I was there for maybe about three months uh, after the special election, and then Governor Engler decides that he wants a tobacco tax increase uh, on, on cigarettes, um, 50 cents per pack. And there was only 57 Republicans in the House, and you need 56 to pass anything in the House. Uh, the Democrats, you would think, might normally be fine with the tobacco tax increase, but they were pissed off at Governor Engler about something else, so they pretended they objected tax increases by saying that um, <laughs> that uh, these uh, tobacco taxes disproportionately hit middle income and lower income people, and they wanted income tax increases. Uh, now, of course, they all voted for other tobacco tax increases in the past, but that doesn't matter. So the go governor could not get any Democrat to support it. So, he needs, so they, they decided to put it through the state house and try and get 56 of the 57 Republicans to support it. Well, the problem was I was there on the floor. I was not going to vote for any tax increase. And the guy who sat next to me was from Troy. His name was Bob Goslin. And Bob was a pretty um, exceptionally fiscally conservative guy. He was a religious guy, uh, kind of socially conservative too, but exceptionally fiscally disciplined. And he wasn't going to vote for it either. There's two guys. Everyone else votes for it. Well, I'll need one more vote. So they exercised a very rarely used procedure where the Speaker of the House can do it issue what's called the call of the house, which means they shut the chamber doors and nobody's allowed to leave. And if anyone wants to leave, the state police escort them back in. And the speaker announces that we're going to sit in this room until another vote appears on the board. They open the board and they, you know, so we sit there and the hours go by. And it's one in the morning. And it's two in the morning. And now all my new colleagues who are just trying to get to know me are looking at me like, you're the biggest a-hole that's ever lived. Because we are sitting here on the House floor because of you. And, it, and, uh, and so you know, the speaker's trying to get Bob Gosling or me to vote yes on this bill. And we're just not voting yes. And then about three in the morning, the speaker comes up and tells me that, he talked like Mickey Mouse, by the way. His name was Rick Johnson. You know, he spoke like this. <laughs> you know, we are, uh, we've got to make some budget cuts around here. And, uh, you know, uh, your staff is on the low end of the totem pole. We just had to hire them because, you know, you're the most recent member. So they might get hit by these uh, budget cuts. So he threatens to fire my staff. So uh, I told him to talk to the hand. So he leaves. Then he comes back about 4.30 in the morning. And he's like, so Leon, uh, I understand you don't want to vote for this tax hike. Right. You realize this tax hike is going to cost the citizens of Michigan about about four hundred fifty million dollars. I know. Yeah, that's why I'm voting no. Goes, well, you could actually minimize the cost. And I said, well, what do you mean? He says, see those two Democrats over there sitting by this rostrum? I go, yeah. And that's Bert Leland. Bert Leland represents part of Detroit, and he's willing to vote yes. We just got to give his sister's apartment to run the uh, water and sewer department. Um, 
Lake Holland Fire Department for the Detroit Water and Sewer Department. We just have to give them two hundred seventy thousand dollars, <laughs> and then he'll vote yes. And then there's another de uh, Democrat from the city who's also willing to vote yes if the uh, athletic department for the city of Detroit, which his uncle runs, is given one point two million dollars. So the speaker's position is: so it's up to you. Do you want the citizens to have to pay four hundred fifty million or four hundred fifty-two million? Uh, so. I'll let you think about it in a minute, but either way, it's going to pass. So what do you do? Let's get the amendment with you, boys. <laughs> <laughs> so if it's going to pass either way, do you vote to minimize the cost, or do you not vote to it? What do you do? If it's going to pass either way, you got to go with the yeah, minimizing. Yeah, yeah. Minimize. Uh, I voted no, and I don't know to this day if I made the right vote. It's a hard one. Yeah, that I kind of agree with that, though. I mean, it's going to pass anyway. At least you stuck. I mean, I don't know. It's a tough call. But it is. The problem is you talk about who had probably. I think I probably would have said that. So now you've also made the election. Right. And there's, there's a political element to it. You think, well, you know what? Right. I told people I'm not going to vote for tax hikes. And if I, in the first three months I'm going to vote for a tax hike, you know, I lied to them. You eat yeah. my lips. <laughs> right. but, but the uh, public comment has another side of This is another example of a tough vote. Not facing me specifically, but a friend of mine who ran for city council. So a friend of mine um, who's a really principled, limited government guy, okay. he ran for uh, a city council in the city of Troy and won. And he called me one night and says, you know, I'm having a problem with a vote coming up. I said, what's the problem? He goes, well, a few years ago, the voters approved building a recreation center in Troy. And there was a special millage that was passed to pay for the recreation center. But then when the economy tanked in the big recession, home values declined and their millage wasn't generating enough revenue to pay the bond back. So he's like, we have to have a vote uh, tomorrow on whether or not we raise the millage rate to pay the bond back or we guess default on the millage. Right. Um, but I promised people I wasn't going to raise taxes. So should he vote to raise taxes, and he said he wouldn't, or should he vote to default on the bond rate and go to court <laughs> and lose in court? I would have said default, and that means people can't trust the city bond anymore. Exactly. Mm. Well, they probably would, if they did vote to default, of course, they, they would go to court, and the court would rule court, yeah. they have to Maybe pay. Maybe sure what people know. Yeah. Well, I asked him, I, it was a tough one for me to advise on, I wasn't sure. Um, but then I asked him, what happened when you passed, when the city passed this millage initially and property values were going up much faster than expected? Did you refund some of the money because you were bringing in too much money? Right. No. So it only works one way. Right. If you're bringing in too much money, no one gets it back. But if you're bringing in not enough money, everyone gets a, a higher tax rate. In addition, there's other issues in the, in the city. They have public employee pensions that are way out of scale with what private sector pays mm -hmm. and things like that. Right. But nonetheless, here's the other reason, though, he was concerned. He says, you know what, Leon, the problem is this. If I vote no, and I'm the only person on the city council with seven members that votes no, every single one of my colleagues is going to look at me like, oh, I see, you're getting ready for your next re-election. And you care more about looking good to the voters than being an adult and being fiscally responsible. We are going to take the tough vote and vote for the legal and moral thing of paying back the people who uh, lend us money, well, you're going to take a nice flight. You're going to protect your re-election. You want to run for something else. So you're going to let us do the heavy lifting while you run around for your happy, uh, I voted no thing. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that's how they're going to look at him every time he wants to do something. It's like, yeah, thanks for helping out when we need the adults in the room. Right. <laughs> you know, right. Um, well, the adults in the room always end up costing us. Well, yeah, that's true. I, I think he ended up voting with them, and I thought he did the wrong thing. Uh, but, you know, there, there's a lot of these little tough votes. Like, the other one he faced was, you know, I told people I'm not going to vote for tax increase. Well, the city of Troy was part of a consortium, a legal consortium, with seven or eight other cities for garbage disposal. Clearly, it's easy. And when the, uh, when, the, when the consortium got hit with a rate increase for dropping off garbage at uh, dumps, the consortium voted to raise everybody's rates, and then every every of uh, seven of uh, eight cities goes back and votes to agree or not. And you're going to get a, you know, it's now you can, uh, how do you vote? 
Because the rates went up. You know, you're part of the legal consortium. That's far we step into voting for you. So those are the kind of votes that you face in real world elections, in real world situations, not the, oh, I voted no on an obviously wasteful item, you know, that sort of thing. Right. It's so funny, too, because you think of everything like, I'm going to be so principled, and blah, 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 and then it's... You yeah. want to be, it's just sorting out what oh. is that principle. And exactly. I'm sorry. Yeah. That, that's just it. There's a lot more convolution than one would think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Remember how you felt trying to be principled during the presidential election? You want to imagine doing that every day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions about being in the legislature or the county board or anything like that? Wait, no. What? Was it, is this a green, green beans? beans. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't see green beans. You're okay. Are you, when are you up for a re election? In 2018. Any plan on running again? Probably, but it's hard to decide because the um, my state senator is terminally out of office. Mm -hmm. And um, it's possible I would look at running for state yeah. senate. Although I'm hesitant to do that because I, I don't think I've done anything yet on the County Board of Commission since I've been back. Um, but it's also a one-time opening. You know, so that's eight more years before it's open again. So, so not six sure. years for state, right? Uh, well, the state is state, state house, not the state side. Right. right. So the the term, but no, that's what it looks like turning out. Oh, okay. Well, you know, what's really bad here is, um, what's, here's the interesting thing. You, there is this metric of, you know, what's the opportunity cost as opposed to the trade-off when you vote on these particular issues left and right. So, you know, the, the, the whole thing is compromise, okay. So if you compromise, are you compromising as taking a baby steps towards liberty? Great. If you're compromising to go their way completely where it's more towards, say, a police state or something, then, then, then it becomes more problematic. Well, Tom, you're, um, you're right. Mur Murray Rothbard addressed this issue about... You know, as libertarians, we hold up what the ideal is. So the ideal is, you know, if there's a if there's a bill that comes up to cut the state income tax by five percent, while some libertarians might say that's ridiculous because that's giving consent to there being a state income tax, and we should be voting for zero income tax or not voting at all, and uh, others would say, well, you know, this moves us toward the ideal, even if it's a five percent cut only. Uh, so, you know, Murray Rothbard, I would say, you move toward the ideal, you always hold up the ideal. You make sure everyone knows what the ideal is, and you're clear about that, and say, well, mm -hmm. we're going to accept this because it moves us toward that. But it's actually sometimes more difficult than, than one thinks when it comes to complicated legislation. Like in some cases, it raises, it increases fees, but reduces regulations in the same bill. So, is it a net? increase for liberty or not, and it's hard to say. And you know, to be honest with you, I'm not the smartest person on earth. So um, when I- I don't think anybody is. <laughs> <laughs> well, Donald Trump, Donald Trump says is. he is. But, uh, oh, screw I, him. <laughs> I, I kept my, um, my, con my, what I say to voters in elections is I want to reduce the size, scope, and cost of government. When I'm elected, I'm not, I, 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 when I'm in the state legislature, I'm, I didn't pretend like I read all 700 bills we vote on every year. Instead, I hired really great libertarian staffers. Right. So I hired Ken Braun, I hired Isaac Morehouse, and their job was to, all I, I told them, I just want to know one thing. And every bill, I want you to understand it well enough, read it, understand it well enough, the analysis, to just tell me, does it, is it a net increase in government or a net decrease in government on balance using your best judgments? And that's all I expected from them to tell me. And you know, that's what was my net for voting. Is there a net increase in, in, in government or a net increase in freedom? And it may be difficult to discern in some cases, but just do the best you can, and that's how I vote. Right. Sometimes it's far more complicated than it needs to be, and sometimes it isn't. It depends on the issue. 
like, like, like for example, a lot of the Republicans who have been voting on the on their so-called repeal and replace Obamacare, okay, um, you know, because of you know the Freedom Caucus, you know, so it's like. Um, okay, so you're the Freedom Caucus. It used to be called the Tea Party Caucus. Now, you know, they're saying, well, we can't, we, we got to make sure we have all those provisions in there that's going to kill Obamacare, that's going to, you know, get us more towards a free market. And then you've got a number of Republicans who are saying, well, we can't do that because, well, um, it's going to cost us more in the long run. It's going to. Uh, I would argue that, and Justin Amash can articulate this better than I could. He might say that this Trump care is not significantly different enough to warrant voting for it. And right. we really a political, the political um, moment right now to get rid of it. But if we accept Trump care. We may never have another vote on this again. Right. Um, so it's like our one-time shot. We shouldn't blow it on a trivial, you know, a tweak. Right. Um, Obamacare light, essentially. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Question for you. A lot of people say, "Hey, it's a tweak in the right direction by one percent. Therefore, it's worth it." Right. <laughs> so you know, every, so there's sometimes the balance between taxes and regulation. Do you have a more in-depth opinion on that? No, it's really hard because. In some cases, regulations are more costly. Um, I was going to say that regulations are more invisible than taxes. Taxes right. are a number people can wrap their head around, mm -hmm. so they might be easier to well, regulations, charge them regulations. So regulations are easier to sell uh, to lawmakers, too, because nobody comes after them in an election and says, you voted for a regulation. And they come after them and say, you voted for a tax hike. Right. right. So, um, you know, we used to have. Um, Sometimes even the groups that you assume might be allies, like when I was in the legislature, a lot of there was business groups. But business groups are oftentimes not <clears throat> ideological, obviously. Right. So when we had the Great Recession coming with the with property values plummeting, all of a sudden the Home Builders Association, which historically I probably voted with 90% of the time, now they want to make it harder for anyone else to be a home builder, a home remodeler, or whatever it is, by a whole new set of regulations Hit that, me they hard. Be, yeah, that they would be grandfathered from. So they wouldn't have to do them. But anybody new wanting to get into the business would. And they pretend this is consumer protection. Oh, we're just stopping these fly-by-night builders. So they uh, say. And the funny thing is, is I've literally called Laura uh -huh. numerous uh -huh. times on contractors without licensure or insurance. Nobody comes out. Nobody cares. Yeah, you know? Well, yep. guess who they do it for? Exactly. exactly. And the Home Builders Association that you brought up, they're all with their buddies and they're trying to figure out, okay, we're going to, you know, pull together our resources and we're going to use our <laughs> crapalistic might. And How can we pull clout? Well, yeah. The government is a weapon, not a tool. Mm -hmm. Just tell them they won't be grandfathered in and see them. Well, one, one important point that I always try to impress people with is that there's an unrealistic expectation for politicians. Uh, not among this group necessarily, because you guys are libertarians, but there's this expectation that people have that politicians should go in there and do what's right for the society. But nobody else lives their life that way. Right. Everybody else goes and buys the car that's right for their family. And then they buy the house that's right for their family. And they take the job that's right for them or the people in their family. Right. So everybody else in society does what's in their interest, in the interest of their family. But somehow, magic is supposed to happen if somebody goes to that one job. All of a sudden, they should vote for what's in their interest. They should vote what's in their family's interest. They should instead vote for everybody else's interest. But nobody else has to do that. Only them. So it's really... That's why uh, government is so inconsistent with human nature. Um, you sh should do what's in the best interest of you and your family with your own resources and with all the, with your own money and so forth. But we shouldn't have some expectation that government can be non-human. That can be a, a group of angels appointed. 
Vast wisdom with their power over others. And all Although they were all would like to play God, no matter what. Well, yeah, it attracts a certain type of people from public office. So, yeah. yeah. All right, so this question just kind of framed as you being party wise an outsider looking at. Uh, when you look at the Libertarian Party specifically, uh, particularly. Um, the Republican uh, state legislators that we had jump from the Republican Party to the Libertarian Party. Um, endorsements coming from former Republican uh, governors and congressmen and whatnot to the Libertarian Party in the last election cycle. How do you see us, do you, do you have any kind of insight as to maybe how the rest of the Republican Party is looking at us? Or do you have any insight, or not insight, or what, what do you feel, how would you assess us, our performance, our growth, <laughs> our future? Well, I think that um, the Republican Party, Democrat Party, first, they're, they're not like a hive mind. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they have different people with different perspectives. And they, all they care about is retaining majority. That's their function. Right. To keep majority for their people who join the party or their group or whatever it is. So it's all they care about. I'll give you a quick story from when I passed the legislation to help the Libertarian Party get majority status. So I, dra I drafted this legislation with the help of uh, Libertarian Party friends of mine. And I went to the Speaker of the House, and I said, hey, I've got this bill, I think it's a good idea. And um, he sort of owed me a, a favor because we've been battling out other things. He thought, oh, we'll make this you know, fucking crazy state rep happy. We'll just pass this stupid bill, but it's never going to go anywhere in the Senate. So, um, but it, it, so it goes to the Senate, and the Senate Majority Leader says, I have no interest in this bill, what, what, what do we care about it? I'm like, all right, so I went and talked to the Governor's Administration, and I talked to the Libertarian Party. The Libertarian Party says, hey, we won't run anybody for governor if, if, if this bill becomes law for this election cycle. Because if, you know, it actually sucks to run someone for governor at the time anyway, because it's a higher ticket, you have to get 5%. So I come back to uh, Senate Majority Leader Ken Sikama, and say, Ken. I was going to ask you about that, by the way. Okay, well, I said, Ken, uh, I got to deal with the governor's office. Uh, the Libertarian Party is not going to run anyone for governor if we pass this bill helping them get major party status. And Ken goes, That's great. That's with the governor, it's not with the Senate. So, what the fuck do you want? And he's like, I want the Libertarian Party of Michigan to not run any Libertarian Party candidates in these 11 seats that are closely contested. All right, so I go talk to the Libertarian Party uh, representative and say, this is what they want. Do you guys want to sit out these 11 seats in this election cycle, yes or no? And after much consultation, they get back and said, yeah, we want to. We're willing to do it because it's, we get this forever, you know, if this bill right. passes. And we just sit out for one cycle in 11 seats. And Keith Edwards actually condemned you for doing that, by the way, nope, publicly. No, did more than condemn me. You fucked me. <laughs> I have I have the emails on the old discussion list about that, by yeah, the way. How, how long ago was this? 2000, 2001 or two. Yeah, somewhere around so, there. So I, we go to the uh, Libertarian Party convention at the time, and sure enough, the chair and everybody involved does not file anybody for those 11 seats. But Keith Edwards and Jelinek do. They file people in a couple of the seats in their home in counties. In those three, this was after the Senate had been passed the bill. So I've got to go back to Senator Sikama, who's now furious, <laughs> saying, Drolette, you're a lying piece of crap. You know, you told me they were going to file people in these 11 seats, and they filed in three of those 11. You're obviously a fucking liar, and don't come back here with any of your legislation in the future. <laughs> so, yeah, that was unfortunate. But the big picture is I think that the political parties only care about the impact of libertarians on elections. Right. You know, and so if it's a close seat, really close seat, they care. If it's not, they don't care. You know, they don't care if you're the Libertarian Party or the Catholic Rat Party or Communist Party or anything. It doesn't matter as long yeah. as you're not trying to fuck them out. They essential. can do a calculation. They're, you're, you know, politicians are dumb at a lot of things, but brilliant at knowing how to stay in office. So they do a very good calculation, okay, this district doesn't matter who's running, 
you know, about, you know, so it's just very powerful. Win or lose. This kind of brings up another question related to that. Um, with the the way the, the, uh, the Freedom Caucus uh, killed the Obamacare, like, <coughs> they've done more, in my mind, than the Libertarian Party has so far. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on building a caucus within one of the parties rather than a third party that would, you know, draw all their attention like that. Because with a caucus, at least you have some external support. I think we have, in some respects, the best of both worlds in that regard. Because the libertarian movement, the liberty movement, is broad. But just like the conservative movement, it consists of more than just Republican politicians. It consists of Republican think tanks like the Heritage you know, Foundation. It consists of so, uh, groups that are conservative. And the liberty movement consists of a lot more than just yep. a political party. The liberty movement consists of our think tanks like the Cato Institute mm -hmm. and others. It consists of uh, social issues, whether it's uh, you know, normal or drug legalization, uh, participation in some of those issues. So ultimately, I think it's important that the libertarian movement be represented in a lot of ways. And the libertarian party specifically does some things unique that it'd be hard for the rest of the movement to do. Um, such as uh, the libertarian party often offers a an, an entryway for people who are who first see the libertarian party or first hear about libertarian ideas. So this happened to a lot of my friends and me when you think, oh, you know, what's his name, Randon, if I can give you this, like Governor Johnson, you know, seeing that there is a Libertarian Party candidate running for president, hearing discussions about that in the media, actually sometimes gets people to start Googling. So it's good press for the yeah, Libertarian it's good, brand. It's good press for the Libertarian brand. And, and he will be in the next place. Okay, now that would, be, be, that would be amazing. So. You know, that really attracts people to the movement. And the Libertarian Party uh, has a role in a lot of you know, political niche things that we do. So I think it's important that we don't say, hey, the way to advance Libertarian ideas is you have to be the Liberty Caucus or the Freedom Caucus and not the Libertarian Party. You have to be the Libertarian Party, but you can't be doing anything in you know, other, other parties. I think if you pick your thing, you can think at it. And you try and get good at it and make a difference and, and you know, stay true to the principles. Well, guys, it's uh, 8 o'clock. Sure. Want to take a short break and then yeah. uh, come back for <laughs> business break. as usual? <laughs> <laughs> so actually, I wanted to ask, um, you see, because you brought up the, uh, the idea of um, how you're not an expert in everything. Nobody is. I wanted to ask this to uh, all of you.